Good afternoon. We've already had a good afternoon. Undoubtedly, Jesus Christ must have taught his disciples something of the principles of spiritual healing because the disciples are credited with having done healing work. And certainly he sent them out into the world often enough to do healing so that we must assume that he taught them something of the subject. None of it, however, has gotten into the New Testament. There is no evidence there of any teaching on the subject of spiritual healing, that is, of how it is accomplished. There are quite a few statements which indicate what the healing principles may have been. There are many reasons for believing that we know the basis of Jesus' healings. There are no teachings, there are no principles revealed except by inference. The same thing happened 500 years before the Master in the experience of Gotama, the Buddha, who left a reputation for healing second only to that of Jesus. Not only that, he did what Jesus did in that he taught disciples how to heal. And they built such a successful healing ministry that there were ashramas all over India where individuals could go and receive spiritual healing. And uh, of the teachings of Buddha, there is only one sign of the principle on which his healing works were based. Whatever else he may have taught has been lost in the mass of literature that has grown up around the teachings of Buddha. There remains only one clear and distinct principle, and this too is one that cannot be proven except in proportion as it is first understood and then demonstrated. The signs that we have in the New Testament pointing to the healing principles of Jesus Christ would indicate <clears throat> that the two, that the major premises of both of these, Gautama and Jesus, were the same. In my thought, at least, it seems clear that they both worked from the same major principle. It may be that as we have more translations of these Dead Sea Scrolls, that we may hear or learn more about this subject. So far in what has been revealed, we have no evidence of uh, any further light on the healing principles. But you never can tell what is going to be turned up. So much of a wonderful nature has already appeared. In modern metaphysics, and by modern I mean the last 90 years, there have been three 
textbooks on spiritual healing or mental and spiritual healing which have stood the test of time and uh, which are authoritative and which have produced healing works not only for thousands of people who have read them and studied them hundreds of thousands but have developed wonderful practitioners who have healed literally multitudes to these I like the number the art of spiritual healing because I believe that having witnessed these principles at work for 30 years I'm safe in saying that this book also will stand the test of time and uh, perform great works I wouldn't say this if it were a newly published book without a background but behind it is 30 years of healing ministry plus 14 years of watching students whom I have taught those very principles. Now, as in the case of Gautama and Jesus, you will find that these three textbooks likewise have as a major principle of demonstration the same principles that are found in those two originals. I'm convinced that that is why these three are the only textbooks of all the hundreds that have been written on the subject that can ever hope to live of the older ones. Now, that principle has really a surprising aspect in that it doesn't go to God, it doesn't pray to God, it doesn't ask God or tell God anything. In fact, God is uh, quite absent from uh, visible evidence in this principle. Actually underlying the principle is God. But you wouldn't know it to hear it voiced or to read it. Because the principle declares that what appears to us as the discords of this world, the sins, the diseases, lack, limitation, and death, that these are of an illusory nature. That is, they are unreal. Well, naturally, if these are of an illusory nature and they're unreal, they don't require any God to do anything to them. They're already nothingness. That nothingness has to be realized, however, not merely stated. Now, any spiritual healing principle to fulfill the demands of a spiritual healing principle must be based not on a God that heals, nor on a God that saves, 
nor on a God that is merciful to you or me or yours or mine, but on a God who made all that was made and then found that all that God made is good. That's where God comes in. God must be recognized and understood as the creative principle of all that is and uh, that all that God is and all that emanates from God is good. This then leaves us not with sin, disease, death, lack or limitation to wipe out or destroy or to have God do something to, but it leaves us with appearances much of the same nature as that ocean that we witnessed out in the desert, that non-existent ocean, that mirage. That particular ocean doesn't need uh, to be drained off the land because it isn't wet. It needs only to be recognized as mirage. Now, the saddest part of the entire teaching of a spiritual uh, message is this, that you have to start with the acknowledgement that even uh, though it says so in these books, it isn't true and uh, can never be made true until realized. Ah, there is the rub. When we say evil is unreal or error is illusory, when we say disease has no law, we're not telling the truth. That's the sad part. As long as there is a material and mental consciousness, sin, disease, and death, and lack and limitation will be real. Infection and contagion will be real. Accidents will be real to material and mental consciousness. And uh, they will only be proven unreal in the presence of uh, the fourth dimensional consciousness, the Christ or transcendental or spiritual whatever you'd like to call it. Now this is probably the most important point for every metaphysician to understand whether or not he is practicing healing through Christian science, divine science, unity, or new thought. This that the words, the statements, the books the knowing of truth none of this is power until you attain the spiritual dimension of consciousness until you attain the spiritual spiritual awareness of the statement you are making. Let me illustrate this. Jesus Christ has a blind man in front of him and he says, open your eyes. But he has another blind man and he puts spittle on them. 
Now, which is the healing principle? Open your eyes or spittle? And the answer must be clear, neither. Because we could say, open your eyes from now until 4th of July next year. And uh, the eyes would probably remain closed. And we could put spittle on blind eyes as long as we could produce it and probably not heal a case. So wherein is the healing principle? Since it can't be in the words, open your eyes, and it can't be in the application of spittle. Well, the answer is the healing principle is the consciousness of Jesus Christ. The fact that he stands there and uh, has attained a level of consciousness in which he knows the unreality of appearances to such an extent that he can say, judge not after appearances, judge righteous judgment. Well, after appearances, here's a man who's blind. Here are two men who are blind. But judging righteous judgment... Ah, now you're in the fourth dimensional consciousness and you can perceive that God made all that was made. Not man, not woman. Jesus must have perceived that you must call no man on earth your father. For one is your father. Well, now, the child of that father surely isn't blind. That, that would be kind of ludicrous to believe that there is a son of God who is blind. And of course there never was one. It is only mortals who can be blind or sick or poor or dead. And therefore, as long as you are dealing with mortals on the level of mortals, it would be better to be a doctor and frankly treat them from the standpoint of appearances. It is only when you have demonstrated the higher consciousness so that you understand that mortals have no existence outside of a universal belief in two powers. Therefore, that which you're seeing with your eyes uh, it doesn't need treatment because uh, if you could make it better, it would still be illusion. It would only be a better illusion. Therefore, you spiritually are beholding God incarnate as the Son. Of course, you can say that with your lips. You can read it in all the metaphysical books, but you can't heal with it. Not until you have attained the awareness of it. Now, it is in the same way. In our works, you will notice often that we use the illustration of uh, infection and contagion. And the reason is that it is the claim that you, uh, in one form or another, that you meet with mostly, and therefore everyone is familiar with it. Now, when a doctor is called to a case of infectious or contagious disease, he has to take certain precautions to prevent uh, his own coming down under that disease. He has to take certain sanitary precautions. But a metaphysician, a metaphysical practitioner, never does. A metaphysical practitioner goes anywhere and everywhere. And it makes no difference what the name or nature of the infection or contagion is. And in my entire experience, I've never heard of a metaphysical practitioner who caught the disease of his patient. I have heard of some who acquired the disease through men mental uh, transference. That's quite a different thing. But no practitioner need fear 
going out to any case of infection or contagion because in the fourth dimension there is no power but God and therefore there is no power in that which is called a disease germ. Now don't make the mistake that many metaphysicians do and go around saying, oh, germs are in power, oh, infection and contagion is in power, because too often you find out they are. It is only when you have entered that fourth dimensional consciousness in some degree that you have rendered infection and contagion of none power and so it is all metaphysical writings agree that disease is unreal but only those can prove it who have in some measure attained that fourth dimensional consciousness that transcendental consciousness which sees not the appearance or rather even if they see it with the eyes do give no recognition to the appearance but to that which underlies the appearance like looking at the mirage and seeing water but through intelligence giving it no concern and going right ahead with the automobile and driving through it. Why? Because through intelligence we look through the flood of water on the road, recognizing its nature as mirage, and go through. So it is. In transcendental consciousness, in fourth dimensional or Christ consciousness, you can heal blindness with spittle. Not because spittle isn't a power, you are proving that because spittle isn't a power and it can cure blindness, that blindness never was a power. Now, let us start with the recognition that healing work cannot be accomplished with the letter of truth alone but that there must be an accompanying degree of spiritual awareness in which that which is real in the material and mental realms are rendered unreal are negated, are dissolved. In our experiments, we took tidal waves and dissolved them before they could strike. In one case, 15 minutes before it was due to strike. In another case, an hour before. This could not be done by standing there looking at a tidal wave and saying you are no power. Although that's the truth, a tidal wave is no power. But declaring that would not manifest it. There must be the attained consciousness And in the presence of that attained consciousness, just as the master made the storm to be still, so would tidal waves or epidemics be made null and void. The reason you would go to Christ Jesus for healing is because you are sure of his attained degree of divine sonship, which means his attained degree of spiritual realization. Spiritual realization of his divine sonship, for we too are divine sons. Only we have recognized it in lesser degree 
and with the human race in none degree. They still insist on calling themselves sinners born in iniquity, brought for, born in sin and brought forth in iniquity. Actually, divine sonship is our true identity. But again, we can't prove it except in the degree of realized consciousness, in the degree of our realized divinity. If you perceive, let us say through your own background of experience, that you have gone to some practitioners and uh, received most wonderful healings and experiences, and that you have gone to others and received none or few or little, or let us say that you know some practitioners who consistently do beautiful healing work, and you know others who do some, and you know others who do little or none. And then you must ask yourself, why? They all have the same books, they all have the same teachings, they all have the same principles. Why does the nature of the work differ? If you can agree that Jesus Christ could heal better than his disciples, and his disciples could probably heal better than some of the others who never attained the rank of disciple, then you will understand that spiritual healing really takes place in the measure, in the degree of one's spiritual development and unfoldment. Now, if you can follow me there in agreement, we can take the next step easily. The next question is, is there a way to attain some reasonable and desirable measure of spiritual consciousness, of healing consciousness? And I will give you the answer from this 30 years experience, yes, anyone with a sincere enough desire not quite, it's so easy to desire, but with a sincere enough to desire to make them go to work, and work hard, and practice hard, and study hard, anyone with that intensity of desire can develop a measure of spiritual consciousness that will include healing consciousness. How is this accomplished? And here I must say to you that different approaches to truth have different principles, and therefore I am not qualified to speak for any of these. I am qualified only to speak from the standpoint of the principles of the infinite way. Be assured of this, however, that there have been enough Christian science practitioners do wonderful healing works in all the world so that we must know that they too have uh, healing principles. There have been enough wonderful healers turned out by unity so that we definitely know they must have healing principles. Therefore, let us say that wherever a student will follow the principles that seem to fit their state of consciousness, they will evolve. 
our work differs in this. All that has been given to me that constitutes the infinite way was given by revelation. And therefore, our basic principles differ from much that has been taught. And while on this one subject we are in agreement with all, that is, the unreal nature of that which you see here, taste, touch, and smell, in that we are in agreement with every one of the recognized successful metaphysical movements and the teaching of the Master and the teaching of Gautama. But from there on, we follow a line of unfoldment that may have some place in those older teachings, but they are not revealed. So far as I know, this is the first time with the Infinite Way that the major healing principles which are embodied in our teaching have been revealed. Let me start with the most important principle and one which is in disagreement with every other metaphysical teaching. That is, the impersonal nature of evil. The infinite way reveals that you are not responsible for the sins you are committing or the diseases from which you are suffering or the lack or the limitation and neither your parents or your grandparents. And neither is the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. And the Communist Party won't solve them. To the infinite way, whatever the name and nature of your problem, if you have one, And you have just living a human life as problem alone, enough, even if it's a healthy and wealthy one. Regardless of the name and nature of your problem, it does not have its rise in you. And therefore, it is not so that if you do wrong thinking, you will get a disease or a lack or a limitation. It is not true that if you worry you'll get ulcers. It is not true that if you have resentment you'll get rheumatism. It is not true that if you hate or are envious or jealous that you'll get cancer. This is an exploded teaching that began with Quimby was carried on by Mrs. Eddy in her early years and later discarded and then picked up by New Thought, finally by psychosomatic medicine and a few other of the medical worlds and someday must be thrown out because there never was a word of truth of it in the beginning and there isn't a word of truth in it now and nobody has ever been able to prove that there is. Disease does not have its rise in you, nor does fear, nor does lack, nor does death. All evil is impersonal. And if you could make yourself the sweetest, gentlest, most loving, 
most moral, most honorable human being in the world, it wouldn't have one single to do with your bodily diseases. They'd still be there. Your turning from a bad human to a good human will not cure your diseases or your poverty or your lacks. It'll make you a better human, of course, nicer to get along with, much better to be married to. But it will not heal your diseases. It will not heal your pro meet your problems. As a matter of fact, I hope this won't discourage you, we have much better effect with men in prison and men in asylums than we do with the good church people. Much better. The good one so seems to have some kind of a righteousness about being good, as if they were good of their own accord, as if they could help being good. But that sinner, he's humble. He knows he's a sinner. He knows he doesn't deserve anything from God, and he's grateful for a crumb and he gets a whole loaf of bread. No, I might also add this. I'd much rather have an atheist for a patient than I would a good, solid Christian or Jew or Hindu. Much, much rather. Much easier to get along with. Much easier to bring to the realization of the true nature of truth. They're always looking for miracle leaders and miracle somebody or other who are uh, already humanly perfect. Let us get straight on this first principle and you'll have very few problems with the others. If you are dealing with a problem of your own or of a relative's, or patient or student, watch the miraculous result when you stop malpracticing them, when you stop calling them a sinner, when you stop laying the blame on their unlovingness or their ungentleness or their ungratefulness or whatever it is you think they're guilty of. Watch the miracle result when you start to ask forgiveness for having uh, pinned sin onto another or seen sin in another or as part of another. Watch what happens when you begin to apologize to God that you have been ascribing mortal qualities to the Son of God. Watch what happens when you begin to realize that all evil has its source in an impersonal source. An ancient mystic, and heaven knows I don't know who he is, but he was one of the greatest who ever lived, coined the name for this impersonal evil and called it Satan or devil. Finest name, really, that's ever been given to us next to the name of God itself. Why? Because seven Satan or devil was never presented as a person, but as an imperson. Not a man or a woman. An impersonal something, completely external to an individual. As you can imagine, watching the Master, Christ Jesus, as Satan stands before him, tempting him. Nobody's blaming Jesus for having ambitions. Nobody is blaming Jesus for wanting to use trickery to get food 
Nobody's blaming Jesus for any of those three sins. It's all blamed on the devil. And rightly so. Only why blame you or me? Why not blame the devil with us too? Why say you are jealous, you are envious, you are stingy, you are hateful, you are malicious? Why? Why? Why not see you and me standing there pure as can be and see this devil out here tempting us and place all of those negative qualities in good friend devil? And then what happens, you and, I, you and I can say, get thee behind me, Satan, and just stand there, watch him while he folds up and disappears and is never heard from any more. Why, Jesus didn't get one single bit of blame for any of those three sins. It was all the devil. And as long as he denied the devil, the sins never get into active expression. They remain dead, lifeless, unexpressed. As long as they were attributed to a devil and the devil wasn't accepted. Now watch this effect in your life when instead of pinning these evils on yourself or your neighbor, your patient or your student, you see each other as the pure and undefiled Son of God, and then realize that all of these temptations, it makes no difference whether it's hate, envy, jealousy, or whether you call it cancer or polio or rheumatism, makes no difference what name you give them, as long as you pin them onto the devil and not onto man. Then when you've got them well pinned onto the devil, say, now get thee behind me, Satan, I'm not interested. Then watch how you have nothingized these claims by impersonalizing them first, nothingizing them second never taking them into your consciousness, never pinning them onto yourself or another. Later on, we are given another term for devil, that is carnal mind. And it's a good name. It's a good name. If we don't like the word devil or Satan, we can use the term carnal mind. And... Uh, when we behold sin, false appetite, disease, erroneous traits of character, anywhere under any circumstances, let us throw it out there into the carnal mind. <coughs> Only do not let us make Paul's mistake of believing that the carnal mind is enmity against God. It isn't. The carnal mind is nothing. It's Satan standing out there tempting. And as long as you don't accept it, carnal mind will just fade away, dissolve and disappear, and with it all of its claims. The carnal mind isn't enmity against anything. <coughs> Certainly not against God, that's for sure. God has no enemies. God is infinite and God is omnipotent and therefore it's an impossibility for an enemy to exist. Believe me, God has no enemies. There is nothing opposed to God. God is infinite. God is omnipotence. God is omniscience. God is omnipresence. In the face of that, you can't have an enemy. You can only have a devil or Satan, which is not entity or being. It's tempter. It's trying to get into your consciousness. It's a belief out here, or a series of beliefs, or appearances, or illusions, all trying to get acceptance in you, like the water on the desert. If only that water on the desert can get acceptance in you, you will never move your car, you will never go forward, you'll be stuck right where you are, at least until nighttime comes.
if you can be made to accept appearances, and appearances always testify to sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation, if you can be made to accept them, you are in and of the material and mental consciousness which is a house divided against itself because it is consisted of, it is constituted of uh, good and evil the material universe and the mental universe are both made up of the two powers good and evil and uh, as long as you are in material or mental consciousness you will be accepting good and evil the moment you begin to perceive the nature of God as omnipotence, you know right well there is no power but God. Therefore, there is nothing that could create an entity or identity of evil. Therefore, any such appearance must be as illusory as the devil that stood before the master. In modern metaphysics, we have another term, mortal mind. If you like, there's no reason why you shouldn't use the term mortal mind as the source of this impersonal error, providing you don't start protecting yourself from it, providing you understand that it isn't an enemy of yours or of God's, that mortal mind is uh, the impersonal tempter presenting appearances which no one has to accept. In our work, we have all of these terms, devil, Satan, carnal mind, mortal mind, and we have a few others. Hypnotism, mesmerism, appearance, claim, belief. It really makes no difference to us which of these you use as long as you do not give them power, as long as you can say, so what? As long as you can say, get thee behind me, Satan, as long as you can say, there is no reality to that which does not emanate from God. Ah, there it is. God is infinite and omnipotent. Can you believe it? Can you accept the fact that nothing can emanate from God except good and that there isn't any other place for anything to emanate from? That's a question. And that's why I say the books won't heal for you. Some people do get healings reading books, but that is more or less an affair of the spirit of grace. But on the whole, either you or your practitioner, and sometimes both, must rise to a place where you have an absolute conviction of omnipotence, of God as the only power. Until you reach that, you will either be on the material level of healing or the mental level of healing. And on the material level, you must always get a physical remedy for a physical discord. On the mental level, you must always get a mental thought to overcome a physical claim. <clears throat> but once you come to the place of no power, not by might, nor by power, you come to the place of resting in the word. You come to the place of realization, recognition, demonstration. <clears throat> in other words, in the infinite way, you are never using any power, not even a spiritual power. You are never using God power. You are never using truth. You are never using God. Never. And there can be no exception to the rule. Never, never, never 
may we use God or truth. We may know the truth, but for the purpose of enlightenment, not for the purpose of producing a result. On the whole, instead of using truth, we make ourselves servants of truth. We make ourselves instruments that truth can use. In other words, truth can use us, but we can never use truth. Truth is always recognized as infinite, therefore something beyond our powers of grasp, whether physically or mentally. Moses discerned that his whole great big temple couldn't house God. Not even the whole world could house God. And so we too recognize that it would be an impossibility for an individual to use infinity. For infinity could not be included within his mental or physical grasp. But we can release ourselves into truth and let it use us so that we may become receptive and responsive to the word of God. Now, watch this. Your very first principle would, of course, be in knowing the nature of God so that we would know definitely that God being good, there is no condition at all unlike good. We would accept the Master's teaching that God is infinite intelligence and knoweth our need and that God is divine love. It is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom and therefore we need not pray for anything. Just seek this consciousness of God and watch the things be added. We would have to thoroughly know and believe become convinced of the nature of God as the nature of God is revealed in these writings. And I admit that for those not familiar with the Infinite Way writings, they'll meet a very strange God, a God that has never prayed to, a God that has never sought for any purpose, a God that does not punish a God that cannot be used for any personal purpose, a God that cannot be used even for you or for me, a God that is so universal that it's already doing what God's supposed to do without anybody asking God to do it, a God that cannot be influenced by the thoughts of man, individually or collectively, but with an understanding of that nature of God, we would find that insufficient to heal, just as the many mystics who have reached a union with God and yet not known how to free themselves from disease because they had not learned, they had not discerned the nature of evil, and even in finding God, made God fit their old conceptions of a power that could be used over some other powers, lesser powers, negative powers, and of course they lost their demonstration through that, because God can't be used. There aren't any powers to use God on. There is no power in the mortal conditions of life, the material or mental conditions of life, except such power as we give by acceptance. Just as Jesus, had he not rejected Satan, would have given power to the tempter and then would have been a sinner. And uh, 
only by his ability to discern the nature of evil could he reject it and not be a victim of it. And uh, there we go back to his healing of the blind or of the man to whom he said, what did hinder you? And here's a crippled man. And the master says, what did hinder you? And that's a foolish remark if ever I heard one. What did hinder you? Can you imagine what that man could have answered? But the master never made a foolish remark. Never. When he said to that man, what did hinder you? He knew beyond all doubt that any material or mental condition of life is only an experience if you accept it. Only if you can be made to accept an appearance as if it were a reality. Only if you can be made to accept the horizon does it become a limitation to your travels. True, the horizon was accepted, wasn't it, until 1492, as a very real barrier. After it was discerned in its true nature, it was no more barrier. And in the same way, as long as there is a materia medica to accept infection and contagion as laws, laws of matter, just that long will that belief be a barrier. Just as long as we accept mental laws, just so long will they be barriers. Why? Because anyone on the spiritual plane can go out and prove they're not laws. Doing it every day of the week, there have been enough millions, there have been enough millions of healings through these principles to awaken the whole Protestant church to the fact that they must add spiritual healing to their teachings. Why do you think they awaken to it? Their people are demanding it. Why are their people demanding it? Because so many of their friends and relatives have been healed. How? Because a practitioner knew that a material law isn't a law, it's a belief. It's a tempter, it's a temptation, it's a mesmeric suggestion. And that practitioner has gone right in and healed in spite of the material laws of infection or contagion or heredity. If it is true as scripture declares, and you may be assured it is true, that God is a lawgiver, God is the law, you can be assured of this, that all law is spiritual. Because if God is infinite, then the only law that a spiritual God could reveal would be a spiritual law. And therefore, that which parades under the title of material law or mental law is fiction. And when it is so understood, you have enough of the transcendental consciousness with which to heal. Did you know that a few weeks ago a great chain of papers across the whole United States published an article by the leading scientist of the world uttering the profound truth that matter is mind? That's hardly believable, is it? When you stop to think that that sentence was written 90 years ago and has been repeated all down through that time and rejected by the scientific world? Now, people say, well, of course, nothing else could be true. 
Why? Because Mr. Von Braun said it. It is in the textbooks all the way back for 90 years that matter is mind. There is no matter as matter. Matter is actually mind, and that is why mind has power over the body. That's why mind can control the body, because the body is made of mind. Ah, yes, but who's going to believe a metaphysician? That article in the newspaper is going to change the history of the next generation, just like that, uh, that statement in the original copy of Science and Health has changed the lives of metaphysicians and has enabled mental and spiritual healing to take place, which never could have taken place if matter had remained matter to the metaphysician. Only because matter is mind can the metaphysician either the